just before I get started, out of curiosity, everybody know what an S-bomb is? Is that news? Half and half? Kind of, maybe? All right, cool. Well, I think then the, the level of this talk will be just perfect then because we're, we're not jumping into code or anything crazy like that, but um, we'll be talking a little bit about securing your software supply chain and what that, what that actually means. So, do a quick introduction. I'm representing lots of folks here today. Um, I'm representing the Indiana IoT Lab. That's how I was asked to do this talk, actually. Um, I'm a member there. Is everybody familiar with the IoT Lab down in Fishers? Does everyone, everyone know where Fishers is on the north side of Indy? Um, so there's an IoT Lab there. You can join as an individual member, but also there's a bunch of company members there, which is it's pretty neat. It's basically just an open space to do IoT innovations. So they have a bunch of 3D printers and laser cutters and a woodworking shop and a very, very cool resource for fishers and for the greater Indianapolis community. Um, like I said, I'm a member there. I do stuff all the time, like these little badges here. These were laser cut. And if you're not familiar with that, it's pretty sweet. They have an industrial size one there, like the size of a small car. Uh, so you can do some really sweet stuff. Uh, very cool place. Uh, very cool startup companies that are kind of incubating there and building new products. So if you're interested, check out the, the website for more. Uh, I'm a Hoosier by birth and by blood. I grew up here in Brownsburg on the west side. I live in Westfield now. I went to Purdue University, which was, of course, the logical choice for very cheap in-state tuition and a great engineering school. Um, studied computer science there. Went to NASA, did, uh, did some work in mission control. That was fun. Supported the shuttle program, STS. Of course, that's retired now, so I'm starting to get a little bit older than I think I am, considering the fact that everything I worked on is long gone. <laughs> um, after we decided we weren't going to space anymore in terms of sending humans, because I cared most about the human aspect of going to space, though the rest is interesting, um, I took a little pivot in my career, got into cybersecurity, I spent about 10 years in the U.S. Intel community, a big chunk of that out at NSA doing signals intelligence. If you're familiar with signals intelligence, um, really fun, obviously cyber related. Um, wanted to move back to Indiana and, you know, couldn't do classified work out of my basement. So I had to jump out and do uh, commercial cybersecurity services, which was a new realm for me. It's pretty fun. Um, I started out here at Pondurance, which is an MDR company. You might have heard of it because it's indie based. Um, and then about a year and a half ago, went over to a startup company called Finite State, and we do IoT uh, supply chain security. It's a SaaS product specific to supply chain security. So um, that's what the talk is about, and kind of go through some of those things. But first, to just kind of lay the groundwork, you know, share some basic statistics. Obviously, probably all four of you know <laughs> that we are seeing explosive growth in terms of connected devices in the billions, tens of billions of connected devices within the next couple of years. That's, that's a huge threat surface. Um, much, much larger than any sort of traditional threat surface that we've seen, right? And of course, the exponential growth of that is concerning and difficult. The cost of cyber physical events is also rising. $50 billion 20, uh, for fatal cyber physical events uh, by 2023 is the recent estimate that I saw. I think that was CISA or something like that. And, and of course, this, this number seems high because we're not really experiencing this here, but this includes things like, you know, cyber physical attacks during wartime and things like that. Um, and then, of course, $20 billion cost of ransomware attacks. Everybody probably believes that number. I think it's likely a little underreported, honestly. Um, and then, of course, we see that bottom thing there. 62% of manufacturers say that they lack the resources necessary to secure the devices that they're manufacturing. And that's pretty scary. So speaking of manufacturers, uh, we kind of break down the entire product security or supply chain security market into two top level organizations. Manufacturers is one, which I already mentioned. Those are the groups, those are the companies, the businesses that are actually making the thing. They're, they're building connected devices. Some of those are consumer grade. You're familiar with you know, the Amazon Echo or the Google Home. Those are all consumer grade connected devices, cool little doorbell cameras, all of that stuff. But a lot of those manufacturers doing industrial grade connected equipment, things that you would find at a hospital or on an assembly line at a factory or, or in an airplane, uh, that sort of 
IoT, the industrial IoT, is really kind of the bread and butter of what we need to address from a security standpoint. The other group is what we call asset owners, and that's basically <laughs> everybody else that uses, anybody that uses a connected device falls under this list. So manufacturers themselves can also be an asset owner. If you're building your own product and you're using somebody else's to help you do that, then you probably have products that another company or another organization made, whether that's on your assembly line in your factories or in your offices. Um, so you're also an asset owner. Um, consumers, all of us, buying something, you put it in your house, you put it in your car, obviously, also asset owners. We don't have any insight into the, you know, the device itself is kind of a black box to us in many ways. Um, and then of course, there's lots of different organizations, hospitals, utilities, defense. You know, if, if there's a, a smart weapons that use connectivity to do targeting or anything at all, I mean, that's a defense, um, you know, asset owner, essentially somebody else uh, like Lockheed Martin built that device originally. So let's look a little bit more closely at the impact uh, kind of sp specifically focused on manufacturers. Um, these are numbers that I we were referencing from Forbes, I believe did an article about this a couple years ago, or maybe even more recently, a year ago. So device manufacturers, 21% of device manufacturers actually have a policy related to supply chain security. So one out of every five companies that makes a connected thing has a policy on supply chain security. That number goes down even more if you get to specifics of software supply chain, which we'll discuss here in a second also. 50% of device manufacturers assess the security of their products before shipping. Only half do any sort of a security assessment on a product before they ship it. And then almost 60% of manufacturers say that they've lost sales because of product security concerns. So that's a pretty big number, 60%. So let's look at why this, why this uh, IoT realm is so attractive to attackers. And, and when I say attackers, it really runs the gambit from all the way up at the very top level of nation state, all the way down to you know, the kid next door. Um, so why is, this, uh, why, why is IoT loved by attackers? What kind of opportunities do we have? Well, first off, what this talk is mostly about is obviously the supply chain. So we have extremely limited visibility into the supply chain of these things, right? You, who has an Amazon Echo or a Google Home or a doorbell camera or something like that? Three out of, okay, all right, all right. Uh, do you have any idea where that hardware came from? Do you have any idea what software is running on that? Any visibility into vulnerabilities for that software, anything? Nope, right very limited visibility in terms of the supply chain, both hardware and software in that case. Um, so if an attacker found a way, let's say, to slip in a little piece of their own code into the firmware of your doorbell camera, you'd have no idea that that was there. And that's pretty true for almost, I mean, for a huge percentage of connected devices, even those high grade connected devices. Uh, there are, um, in terms of supply chain complexity, if you think about an F-16, everyone knows what an F-16 is, the Fighting Falcon, really cool Air Force jet, air dominance fighter, probably one of the best we made until the F-22. Um, that thing has about, I think it was a half, a half a billion, no, half a million lines of code that run the main systems for flight. Half a million lines of code, pretty small. Your average car right now has half a billion so that's an exponential increase in the attack surface for the car that you would buy versus an F-16 fighter jet. That's pretty incredible. And of course, you have no idea what any of that is. Neither do I. Um, so that supply chain threat surface is one of the reasons attackers love IoT. Access is another one of those reasons why attackers love IoT. We have all sorts of physical uh, restraints on servers, right? And you have to badge into a server room. A lot of times the, you know, there's a cage that's locked and you need an additional key and only certain people have access. Literally physical access to those things is much harder. Whereas your doorbell or anything that's just floating around an assembly line is out there. You have access to it physically. It's easy to plug something in. Another way to look at that. 
Um, you also have all of these software-defined physical functions in critical environments where software controls something real that moves. It's not just software and software. There's this physical interaction with those specific devices. So the impact of having you know, ineffective or breached software can actually manifest itself in the physical world. Attackers love that. <laughs> um, you've, probably seen, you've probably seen like the smart door locks, right? If you could hack that and unlock a door, then obviously that's a lot easier than trying to saw through or break into a window or something like that. So that, that physical connection there is really important to attackers. And then of course, security, what we're all here to talk about. So <laughs> most AppSec tools, or maybe all AppSec tools, simply do not work on connected devices or embedded devices. Very, very low visibility in terms of protection from traditional security tools. A lot of your endpoint protection tools, which are awesome for your MacBook, your Windows laptop, literally you cannot run on an embedded device. You can't run the agent. The thing that runs on your computer cannot run on an embedded device for whatever reason. A lot of times it's just simply not supported, an operating system that's not supported. You know, they don't have a compiled version that will run on that. A lot of times it's extremely limited memory. Um, whereas a lot of those tools require a lot of memory in order to run locally and protect your device. So we have very, very limited tools available to protect devices in real time that are kind of in this category. And honestly, we've placed a very low priority on those. <laughs> and that's kind of been a historical trend because it's like, oh, well, you know, if someone hacks my, my microwave, what else can they do? Nothing, right? Um, but that's changing. If you replace microwave with some critical million dollar piece of equipment that's manufacturing your product, you have a problem there. And then of course, this one is very well known, but patching and updating these things can be incredibly difficult. You cannot guarantee that they're online, when they're online, how they're online. Um, sometimes patches and updates simply break things. You, can, you, know, you literally cannot update it to a new version because it will break the whole device, because it was built around a specific version of firmware, a specific version of the OS. So it becomes really, really difficult to manage that cycle for those things. So we've established this a pretty big attack surface, um, but what about the actual like, reasons behind using these devices? Why are they becoming so ubiquitous? Why do we have this explosion of billions and billions of devices in just a few years? Well, if we think about the product itself, those connected products, they're really just the tip of the iceberg. What are we mostly after when we're employing those products in the business context? Most of the time, we're after some sort of data. You know, like they, they were going to provide a certain data, certain insight into some process that we didn't have insight into before. If you think about basically any sensor, this is its function, right? I want to know what the temperature is in my kid's room so they're not too hot or they're not too cold. It's all about collecting the data. And what do we do with that data? Well, we make decisions. We turn up the thermostat or we turn on the fan. Or businesses are doing the same thing with all these connected devices and they're doing it in an automated fashion. So all of those decisions based on the data that's flowing in is being automated and they're building processes and they're making decisions about risk management um, and they're doing technical and financial forecasting all based around the value that's being delivered by these connected products that they've invested in. And there's nothing wrong with that. Most cases, that's good. There's a notable, kind of a notable famous case where that's bad. Uh, everybody know what happened with the 737 MAX 8? Is everyone familiar with the technical specifications of what happened with that? Um, it was basically a single sensor that was a single point of failure where we were relying on the data to make automated flight decisions for the aircraft, failed, produced this state where the plane was making decisions based on you know, faulty data, essentially. And that can turn out really, really bad, as we discovered. So let's look at this from the lens of software specifically for a little bit here, because that's, kind of that's kind of my thing. If you think about your software supply chain, what do I mean when I say that? So, Take one of your devices that you have at home and think about everything that runs on that device in order for you to be able to talk to it and get responses. You're, you obviously have that top level components there, all of the individual apps. 
if you have an Echo or a Google Home, that, that's, you see those on your phone, right? Like, I want to enable this app that makes the dog barking sound when I ask it to, right? That's, that's an app. Those, all those software, you know, those high-level software projects. But all of those things are built on top of libraries. The developers didn't build those apps from scratch. They imported code that somebody else wrote in order to build on top of that to make their lives easier. And of course, that's built on top of the operating system, real-time operating systems most of the time in these de embedded devices, which is built on top of the firmware, which is the connection between the operating system and the hardware. How do you actually interact with the speaker or the microphone on those things? And then, of course, you get all the way down to the hardware components. And every single one of those layers is backed by a whole series of vendors that produced that thing. They're, you know, vendor A that produced apps and libraries and maybe some firmware and vendor B that did the same thing and vendor C that did the same thing. And while sometimes you might have a little bit of visibility into these guys here and, and maybe you say like, oh, well, I know that Jason built this app because he's listed as the developer for that. You probably have no idea <laughs> Who supplied me with that? So who are the vendors that are even behind that first layer of vendors? And how deep does that vendor chain go? That's what we kind of call the software supply chain. So tracing that back all the way through all of the steps and trying to figure out what the heck's in this thing can actually be a really, really difficult challenge. And I, I will say literally nobody's doing that well yet. We are, we are building things out and learning and getting better, but even the name brand companies that are household names still, for the most part, struggle with that challenge and don't know what's in their software at that granular level, component by component. So when we think about that supply chain with all the vendors kind of, let's look at it from the software perspective and see where can vulnerabilities enter somewhere in this chain. So I think one of the obvious things, of course, is through open source, right? Who knows who built that? If you didn't review all the code yourself, if you're not intimately familiar with all the libraries and packages that are used in there, there's probably a bunch of CVEs. Who uses OpenSSL? Anybody? Yeah, well, there's a bunch of CVEs for OpenSSL, even newer versions, right? That's obvious spot where vulnerabilities enter the supply chain, and we can see that on MITRE's webpage just by looking up individual components uh, in the CVE database, right? Third-party code. So these are all of those vendors, you know, that have basically built code for you. So you've hired somebody, they've built code, or maybe you've bought their product and incorporated it into your environment. Um, obviously, they're building on top of open source a lot of times and potentially even other vendors behind there. So that's like the next step where vulnerabilities can enter is whatever that third-party vendor has done. First party, this is the code that you've written. Your teams, your developers actually introduce vulnerabilities into the supply chain here. Usually it's unintentional, all right? We just didn't, you know, write something in a secure way or we didn't consider some, you know, specific edge case when we were building our product um, and it introduces a vulnerability. Sometimes it can be intentional. That would be an insider attack if a developer specifically put something bad in there, the back doors or whatever. Um, that's fairly rare. I say vast majority of the time, first party vulnerabilities are unintentional. Everybody makes mistake, uh, you know, mistakes. I spent a long time before I was engineering manager as a software developer, I made tons of mistakes. I'm sure I introduced plenty of vulnerabilities unintentionally into all of the products that I worked on building. Even once you get past that, let's say you did everything perfectly up to that point, now you still have the actual implementation of the code, you know, in the product, in your environment, and you have all these, con you know, configuration issues. You could be using a perfectly secure version of a web server and you misconfigure it, lots of vulnerabilities. And so the way that you implement all of the code matters. And, and this is interesting too, uh, kind of an aside and outside of this, this scope of this talk, but um, whenever you hear talk about like crypto vulnerabilities, like AES has this vulnerability, if you've ever heard something like that, well, the math behind AES does not have a vulnerability. It's the implementation of that that actually introduced a vulnerability somehow. Um, that's kind of falls under this configuration stage. If you don't do it, you know, if you don't implement it correctly, more vulnerabilities in your supply chain. 
Um, and then, of course, your updates and your patches. <laughs> We've seen this lots of times, honestly. If you don't, you know, if you have, let's say, just an endpoint that's listening for an update. So when you're ready to push an update to your devices, all you have to do is tell your server, like, you know, or you tell your device, hit this endpoint every night and see if there's a, an update there that I can go and grab. Well, that's pretty easy for somebody else to just give you whatever update they want, right? So, of course, we have, you know, all of the big name device producers have um, updates or patches that are signed. You have to use crypto to verify that those are right. We do a couple of other things along that path, but, but a lot don't. A lot just have it check a certain spot every night and that's it. So if you reroute that at your firewall or at your, you know, router layer to somewhere else, then too bad. You get whatever update somebody else wants you to get. All right, so let's break it down. I, I, I had mentioned kind of the organizations already, asset owners and manufacturers. Let's look at the difficulty of this problem from the lens of those two. So looking at the type of your organization. So before we even get to manufacturers and asset owners, let's look at software suppliers all the way over there at the left. This is an organization that literally their job is to produce software and supply it to others. Even at that level, where the, their job is to write new software, only about 70% of that is going to be first party code. What's the other 30%? What's your guess? Open source. Yeah, open source libraries that have already been built. We're going to build on top of those. Even as a software supplier, you're still a third of your code base is probably not something that you wrote. And I think that's a fairly generous estimate. I feel like it's probably more like 50%, but that's just me. I don't have any numbers to back it up, just a gut feeling. Um, so already, right away, even at the very far left edge of this organization view, you're still already worried about this entire, basically, chain of, you know, what could go wrong in that 30%. And then, of course, you have 70% first party code, so that's the supplier's you know, uh, developers introducing those vulnerabilities and so on and so forth. So let's go to the next organization here. So this is the component supplier. This is like where you're you know, basically putting together multiple pieces to, to you know, supply a particular system. Um, there's lots of, you know, examples of this all around, but you're not really producing a product yet, but you're, you're building a, an ecosystem that is then going to be used by the product trying to think of a good uh, example for things that you would have at home. Um, well, anybody familiar with SunFounder? If you play around with Raspberry Pis and all of the little sensors and everything that you can plug into it, SunFounder is an organization that would kind of fall into this component supplier category. They're not really manufacturing any device per se, but they are providing a whole bunch of code and a whole bunch of functionality sort of out of the box in a more complex sort of hardware software system package. 40% of that is first party code, which means 60% of that is not. So you're already, again, kind of decreasing that first party code as you move along. And by the time you get all the way to the device manufacturer, so now you're at someone who's actually building a connected product literally only about 20% of that code in that product is created at that level. That first, first party code from the device manufacturer, only about 20%. So 80% of what the device manufacturer has in any given device that they're producing came from a previous stage in the supply chain. Which means, what does that mean about their visibility into that? probably much lower than visibility into your first party code, right? And then of course you get all the way over to asset owners. This is us and this is hospitals and police departments and you know basically every company on the planet. And all of a sudden you're down to less than 5% is code that you've developed internally. 95 plus percent of all of that software supply chain that you should be concerned with is stuff that you inherited by bringing that device into your environment. Obviously, that means the supply chain at this point is incredibly, incredibly complex. So if I had to sum that up into a billion dollar question, maybe a hundred billion dollar question industry-wide, if a new CVE were disclosed right now or today that's going to impact some of your products 
as a manufacturer or the products you use as an asset owner, how long would it take you to find out which products and which versions? And of course, can you remediate those? And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit more here. So, we've got it. I know how we're going to solve this problem. We're going to start an AppSec program, so that way we can monitor and enforce security of all of our applications. That'll do it, right? Well, let's go back to our handy-dandy NIST cybersecurity framework. Everyone pretty familiar with this, right? This is like, I don't know, probably 15 years old at this point. But it still makes sense. It still makes sense as a framework. Uh, where on this wheel do you think AppSec alone, if you, did, if you did application security in a vacuum, where on this wheel do you think it kind of fits in? Identifying, protecting, detecting, responding, recovering. Identifying. identifying, definitely. Part of an AppSec program is going to be understanding what applications you have and where those are. Yeah, absolutely. Identifying. What else? Is that it? Definitely, AppSec protects. Yeah, it definitely fits into protection because a whole, you know, preventative security around those applications and is a big part of what an AppSec tool would give you. Absolutely, yeah. Most AppSec tools don't do anything for detection, response, or recovering, though. So you're already kind of like squeezing your security program into only two out of the five pie slices of the NIST cybersecurity framework if you're only doing AppSec in, in kind of a, a vacuum, right? Of course, we want to do more than that. Um, and you have to take into a whole bunch of things, or, or, or even within like the protection category, you're trying to prevent attacks from happening in the first place, you have to take into account a whole bunch of things that are very, very challenging from an AppSec alone perspective. So what about context of that, where that application is running. That's going to matter, right? If, you've, if your AppSec tool discovers 18,000 problems with your applications, I can guarantee your teams are not going to have time to fix and triage all of those. So you have to have a way to prioritize that and understand where your risk actually lies. And so how do you do that? Well, part of that is context. And if you don't have any context, in terms of where that application is actually running, it's going to be really, really difficult. Another one of the challenges in that field, in that kind of protection field, is that most of the tools available on the market today are heavily, heavily geared toward web applications specifically. Some are geared toward mobile applications, um, and that's great, but that's two things out of thousands of potential firmware, you know, architectures, device setups, and things like that. All right, so AppSec is awesome, but we know it's not quite enough. We know we have to do more in that whole life cycle, especially if we're working with connected products specifically. So then we said, all right, in addition to doing our AppSec and our kind of traditional security monitoring, we're going to start requiring SBOMs. SBOM stands for Software Bill of Materials. So what a Software Bill of Materials is, is basically an entire rundown of every single software component that you can possibly discover in that software supply chain. So all of those open source packages that you included, all of those third party packages and libraries and code, all of the first party stuff, all along that chain where we talked about where vulnerabilities could be introduced, we want to put that together in one document that gives me the visibility so I know every single component and every single component version that exists in my code at any given time. So that's great. That's like a huge step forward. And this is very recent. The whole like requiring SBOMs thing, nobody does that except for one, the federal government. And they literally just started this year. So that's brand new th that we're going to start thinking about requiring SBOMs in order to do business with you know, a lot of those software suppliers and device manufacturers and so on. By the way, the SBOM kind of like gives you more and more visibility the further you are, further to the right you are, to the right you are in the chain. So if you're an asset owner, this increases your visibility tremendously because you would have had nothing, you know, visibility wise to the left. And then of course, as you get all the way to the supplier, you know, you have a lot more visibility to start. So the SBOM is really just giving you visibility into those open source components, libraries, things like that, that you've built on top of. But it does, you know, the SBOM alone, while it gives you this great visibility, it's a great step forward, 
there's still a lot of challenges around device security in general and the SBOM itself that that document by itself cannot solve. So the first off is of course vendor trust. If you're getting the SBOMs from your device manufacturer, you know, an asset owner could get it from a device manufacturer, device manufacturer could get it from a, a supplier or a vendor, right? How confident are you that, that it's accurate? Are you sure that it's right? Because I could tell you from very common experience, a lot of times it's not. And it's not that it's necessarily wrong, but it could be incomplete. If a device manufacturer doesn't even know what's in their software supply chain, how are they expected to tell you as an asset owner? And you can trace that all the way back to the chain. So you go all the way back to that software supplier and you have, you know, fairly good visibility, maybe a handful of things you didn't realize were there. That handful of things then gets perpetuated. So the next step in the chain, they're not going to know it's there and then they probably add a few things that they don't know is there so so you start with a few things and now you have like eight or ten things and then you know it continues to grow by the time you get to the asset owner there's maybe 30 components in there that you have no idea actually exist if you're looking solely at the s-bombs you also have those pesky configuration issues tons of vulnerabilities that we can pick out in static analysis aren't actually going to be applicable because of however it's configured in an actual deployed environment. Not only that, but a lot of them aren't going to be exploitable. So when you have all of these vulnerabilities you have to try and triage, how are you going to prioritize those if you don't understand, you don't have any visibility into the configuration or the exploitability or anything like that in a post-deployment sort of world? <coughs> and then, of course, there's the response piece, which is, now you have this new vulnerability, which goes back to the billion dollar question. Now you have this new vulnerability that was discovered in a component. How long does it take you to figure out where you have that component and what you can do about it? This is not a new problem, by the way. This problem has been around for a really, really long time. And if you think about how we've adapted to it, let's take cars for an example. What's that fancy, long, crazy number that your car has under the windshield on the driver's side? Mostly on the driver's side. What's that? Yeah, VIN. What does that do? It uniquely identifies that car, right? And on the back end, your car manufacturer has that VIN number, and they have a list of all the stuff that's in there. They know what engine is in there. They know what muffler is in there. They know every single component of the car that is associated with that VIN or even a set of VINs, right? So when they have a recall on a transmission problem, it's literally just a query like, all right, well, which cars have this problem? Poof, here you go. Here's the list. They can send out an email to all the owners, mail you, usually they also mail you stuff. They can update your app if you have, you know, if you have a, an app for your car or whatever. And it's literally that easy to identify where that is. Does that exist? For software components, not even close. <laughs> I wish it did, but then I'd be out of a job. So maybe I don't wish it did. <laughs> so let's think about that problem. In the SBOM, we have this nice view and this list of all these software components. Given just that, where do you think the SBOM by itself fits into the NIST cybersecurity framework? Does it help you identify potential threat surface? Yeah, absolutely. Does it help you protect that particular threat surface? Not directly. Yeah, not directly, right. Does it help you detect any new threats? Yeah, not really. Does it help you respond? Maybe. If you can actually you know, list out the components, if you get a new CVE and you can list out the components and find where those components are, but it requires a huge query tool or something to operationalize that response, right? Does it help you recover? No, nah, not really. By itself, it doesn't really do anything other than identify the threat surface, and maybe if you implement it right, give you a means to respond. So we're skipping detection, skipping part of response, skipping over protection, and not really doing much in terms of recovery. So I think it's pretty clear. <laughs> the SBOM alone is also not enough. So 
great visibility. It's a foundational step, but we have to do so much more if we expect to actually secure the supply chain. So, of course, what are we going to do? Where are we on time? 310. Oh, that's actually pretty late. So what are we going to do from a product security perspective then to secure the supply chain? Well, just like NIST, we approach the product security as a life cycle problem. It's not a point in time problem. There's no single tool that you can just buy and have it work and magically fix it, right? Magically make it secure. It's an ongoing process that we have to live and breathe as an organization every single day. And the product security life cycle shouldn't be particularly surprising, but it aligns fairly well with the NIST cybersecurity framework. So how are we actually going to do this? I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through all these on this slide because I have a separate slide to break down each one that I think is far more interesting and pretty than this particular slide. But we're going to start off, remember identify was kind of that first, you know, first phase in the cybersecurity framework. We're going to start off with discovering. So this is basically collecting, discovering, and organizing everything in your software supply chain. This is your SBOM right here. That's a big piece of it. But if you're not getting an SBOM, it can be pretty difficult to do that. Um, so there's a couple of different ways. Obviously, you can do, you know, you can ask for an S bomb, you know, ask for S bombs. You can do static analysis on open source code to figure out what libraries are in there and try to build it out. There's some tools to help you generate S bombs from open source, you know, tools, things like that. But what if all you have is compiled firmware? You have a device, and on there is, are literally the binaries. What can you do then? Well, then you have to do binary and software analysis. You have to reverse engineer those things to figure out what the heck's in them. And that's a hard problem. And on top of that, as part of this discover phase, you're also trying to figure out if you can analyze risk for any of that existing like first party, maybe sometimes third party code that's in your ecosystem. So if you're writing the code, you're obviously not trying to produce an S-bomb from a binary or from open source, but instead you're trying to identify the risks that your team's introducing. And all of that is just part of this first step of discovering the threat surface. This is kind of where S-bombs live and, and breathe and mostly die, but there's good news because there is a process for this. Let's say that you've done the, the discovery stage well, you know all of your software components, um, you have great S-bombs, you've done binary analysis on the things you don't have S-bombs for, you, you think you know what's in all of those, then what do you do with that information? The S-bomb alone is not enough. What do you have to do? We've got a list of software components. Well, now I need to know which ones of those are actually vulnerable. I need to match that up with vulnerabilities. Best vulnerability database on the planet, still CVEs. So we want to match up those software components with CVEs. We probably want to look for weaknesses too, so we want to match those up with CWEs. And then, of course, if you're capable, you want to try to match those up in an ongoing basis with any sort of zero-day vulnerabilities that could be present there. So that's when you get down into the, the, the roots of analyzing you know, things like buffer overflows and all, you know, the OWASP top 10 and all of those you know, fun terms, everything that we really like to read about in security class. But it's, it's actually like super high. It's super high fruit where there's also this low-hanging fruit of just understanding where vulnerabilities are, matching it with known things. And the trick here is you have to do all of this at the speed of your DevOps cycle. If your, de if your sprint cycle is two weeks, and you're pushing new code every two weeks, then you have to do this step. You have to be assessing these vulnerabilities in your software supply chain at that speed. Otherwise, you're way behind. Otherwise, you're going to have a whole bunch of code that's been pushed out there by your development teams into your product, and you're going to have no visibility in terms of assessing the vulnerability of that. So that's pretty fast. And then what? Well, turns out, even if you do the first two steps really well, you assess and you find all those vulnerabilities, for the most part, nobody cares yet. They're going to say, well, <laughs> This device has 20,000 vulnerabilities. What am I supposed to do with that? I just, like, I only care about the things that are really going to raise my risk, right? I don't care about all these other things that are minor because I don't have time to work on them. Well, you have to be able to prioritize all of those vulnerabilities that you've now matched up with the software components. And how are you going to do that? Well, there's a couple of things to look at in terms of 
vulnerability. You see them on the points of this triangle, right? So the, the first is the exploitability context. Uh, so literally, an easy way to think of that is, can it be exploited? If the vulnerability can't be exploited, if it can't be triggered in some way, then you're going to deprioritize that. And that's OK, because we have to, do, we have to go through this prioritiz prioritization step. Literally not going to be able to fix every imaginable vulnerability in our supply chain. If we know that there's one that cannot be exploited, for whatever reason that is, so that exploitability context, then let's not worry about it right now, because there's going to be others that are able to be exploited, and we need to focus on those. Then we look at the threat context. Um, so that's kind of like when you, when you want to uh, like determine which of those exploitable vulnerabilities are most likely to be exploited. So if there's an exploitable vulnerability, but it's absolutely incredibly difficult from a technical perspective, you would need like a nation state level knowledge to be able to exploit it. There's no existing tool that somebody can just download to exploit it then obviously that kind of changes your prioritization because of that threat context. And at that point you could say, well, if Russia targets my organization with that specific exploit because they have knowledge of it somehow, then that's probably a risk. But for 99.9999% of the other threats out there, we're going to deprioritize this because the threat context there is fairly low. Very difficult to exploit. Um, and then the third thing here that you want to look at, of course, is the vulnerability context. This one's always the most obvious. This is kind of the thing that everyone thinks of first. How severe is the vulnerability? If it were to be exploited, what's the impact to my product or my organization? Obviously, that's the one out of these three things that most organizations know about and most organizations, I would say, prioritize based on. But it's only one third of what we should actually be prioritizing on. Sometimes, even the most severe vulnerabilities can be deprioritized because they're not exploitable or because the threat context is very, very low. When you take those three things together, we call that risk scoring. You know, what's your risk? Because that's a term that businesses understand. Engineers don't care much about risk. They care about all the cool stuff and exploiting and threats and, and vulnerabilities. But when you go into the boardroom, they don't care about any of that. They only care about what's my risk? What's the risk to the business? What's the risk to the product? So when we take all three of those together, that's the context we're looking for, is the overall risk. All right, whew, this is a lot. Everybody, everybody feeling good so far? Feel, feeling like we're gonna, in a year or two, we're gonna be totally secure in our software supply chains? <laughs> so let's say that you've, you know, you've gone through, you've identified your, you know, all of your software components, you understand what's in your supply chain, You've matched that up to your vulnerabilities and created that landscape. You've prioritized all of those based on exploitability and threat context. Then the next obvious step is, of course, you have to take action on that. If you do all of that and you don't have a product security team to do anything about it, then you literally just wasted your time. Because if you're not going to take action on what you've discovered, what's the point, right? Remediation is that action step. So you, you obviously want to be able to fix and verify those issues are fixed across your supply chain. There's lots of ways that you can do this. Um, a lot of times, honestly, it's an update. If you can update a package to a new version that no longer has a particular CVE, that's no longer exploitable, then you're good. Now that might introduce new ones, but maybe the new ones are lower priority or less severe or not exploitable. Um, there's probably I would say 20 to 30 typical things that would go into this step that are all part of remediation guidance and there's lots of ways that you can kind of present that um, but the bottom line is you really want to take that actionable intelligence that you've created in those first three steps and turn it in you know do it do it and then be able to produce reporting to monitor and verify that that has indeed happened in your production environment this one's my least favorite one to talk about because it's the obvious one. Right? It's like, well, of course you have to fix it. You know, <laughs> what else? Are you, what else should we do there? But of course, it has to be part of the life cycle. This one is really fun. So this is the billion-dollar question right here, and this is what everybody struggles really very much with, and that's the response. So, it, given a new CVE, 
Log4j is a famous example, right? We've got this new catastrophic problem. How do we fix it? Okay, well, first we got to figure out where it is. And that's a hard, hard thing to do if you haven't already positioned yourself with all of the things we've already talked about up to this point. Because now you're literally going back to the start and you're saying, man, I don't even have an SBOM. Where do I even start then? If I don't even have a list of software components that are in my connected products, how in the world am I supposed to find the connected things that have log4j in it? That's a software component or a software package even. And specific components of that are the ones that are vulnerable. And if I don't at least have a list, I don't even know where to start. I have to start by creating the list, right? And that's what we saw. That's what we, when the news cycles are running, like, I can't believe it's taken six months for organizations to fix this problem. That's why, is because they literally had to go all the way back to the beginning and just start with the list of figuring out what is where. So if you've set yourself up for success up to this point already, you have a product security team and they're working on this and you have SBOMs and you've assessed and you've prioritized and you've been, you know, remediating back and forth and your team is iterating on those remediations, then what you do from that point is all of that data has to be captured. All of that information from your SBOMs, from your vulnerability analysis, from your prioritization has to be captured in, let's call it a database for lack of a better term. There's lots of different ways to capture that, but you have to be able to capture it so you can query it. That's what the car companies do with, the, with a recall on the transmission, right? They literally just go and type in the, you know, a, a particular transmission identifier and poof, here's a giant list of all the VINs that that transmission went into. So we want to be able to do the same thing here. But in order to do that, we have to build up that knowledge base to begin with by going through all of the previous steps. So this one is really, really hard. It's really easy to understand and really easy to talk about because it's just a big data query, ultimately. But populating the data to support that query is really difficult. And it's a really fun problem to solve. And I would say we're about 0.0001% of the way as, a, as an entire security community of building up that data set. We have a long way to go. So if you're looking for a really fun job in cybersecurity, there's lots of work to be done on the product security and supply chain security side. And there's no doubt about that. Finally, uh, this one might be the second most boring to talk about, but it's super critical because you have to convince your board to invest in product security and supply chain security from the start, right? How are you going to do that? Well, you're going to show them these really cool dashboards about how you're reducing your risk uh, with all this data that you've built up, right? You're going to show them, here's the risk of our whole portfolio. We, have, we make 19 connected devices and here's the total risk across our whole organization and you're going to be able to lay out specific things within that that maximize the risk or minimize the risk and you can present that case so that your teams can improve but also uh, so that you can convince your organization to continue to invest uh, in security in product security the other thing that goes in here which is a little outside the scope of this talk is of course this will also get you a really long way down the compliance path if you're at an organization where you have to follow certain compliance standards then this is how you can prove that you're doing that, basically. All right, so this is too much to read. I don't really like this slide, but I don't have a better one right now. So don't read it all. The point of this slide is, if you're looking at what type of organization you are, device manufacturer and asset owner, and you're looking at everything that we just talked about, that whole product security life cycle, discover, assess, prioritize, remediate, respond, and improve, the things that you're going to do there are extraordinarily similar with a couple of little tiny tweaks. For example, with device manufacturers, when you discover, you build your SBOMs, you want to do it across your entire product portfolio, every single device that you make. For your asset owners, you want to do that against your asset inventory, every single device that you buy. But the process is the same. And that's kind of the point of this slide, is to show that all these things apply very similarly to both sets of organizations with just little tweaks about what it applies to. All right, let's kind of wrap things up because we're running out of time. So where does product security live in this life cycle now? We talked about some of the other things. We talked about AppSec by itself. We talked about SBOMs by itself and where they live. 
where do you think product security could live in this life cycle? Does it live in identify? And when I say product security, I mean that whole life cycle that we talked about. S-bombs is part of that, so we know it lives in the identify phase. What about protection? Do we do any protection, anything preventative in that? If you're identifying vulnerabilities and exploitability, then you're probably doing a great amount of work that would fall under the preventative care for your devices. Detection? What about detection? Are we going to be able to detect those things? Yeah, that's, that's a big piece of you know, what all of that database that we're building up is detecting where those vulnerabilities that are exploitable live in our environment. Response, that's literally the same word that's in the product security lifecycle, right? That's the query of that big data database. And then, of course, our improvement step. So the product security lifecycle should pretty much match up with the cybersecurity lifecycle in, in general. Now, this, was, this I put in here in case we had a little extra time because I wasn't sure how fast I would talk. Um, so I'll breeze through it super fast because we are running low on time. But just as an example, you might, th you might think, well, what, where could I incorporate product security into you know, something I'm already doing? Like right now I'm doing detections based on network traffic and logs. I'm doing traditional like managed detection and response, I think is what the industry sort of calls that. You're collecting network data, you're collecting a bunch of log data, and you're looking through there for things that look bad or look like an attack, right? And that all typically maps to the MITRE attack framework. Everyone's probably pretty familiar with that. So let's look at initial access. This is like the first thing you can discover in the, in the, in the cyber kill chain when you know, bad guys try to get into your environment. Which one of these techniques can product security impact? Basically everything except phishing, <laughs> right? When you're talking about supply chain security, Drive-bys, you know, injecting code in a website or something like that is literally the definition of understanding the supply chain. Um, exploiting public-facing applications. That public-facing facing application, that means that there's a vulnerability and a component in that software supply chain that can be exploitable. So that was shipped with a vulnerability in it. So definitely a software supply chain impact there. If you identified that ahead of time and mitigated it, wouldn't be able to exploit as an initial access vector. And we can go on and on down the list. The bottom line is when you look at attack and you look at the data that's provided by our product security lifecycle or supply chain security lifecycle, we can really incorporate that into just about every single one of these techniques. How? What's an easy way? Basic implementation. This is kind of fun as a proof of concept, but I don't know of anybody that's truly doing this well on, a, on an industrial level quite yet. But let's just say we analyze our product. Let's say we have a product with some firmware. We analyze that. We can pull out a bunch of observables from that. We know, for example, like what certificates the firmware is going to use and what services can run based on the packages that are present in that firmware. SSH can't run in a network if SSH, the code, <laughs> or the package is not present on the device, right? So we can pull out all of those observables. And then when we're capturing and analyzing our network and log traffic, we can match those two sets of observables up. So you can start to see things like this particular device, what did it actually do on the network? Well, it reached out over here, it reached out over here, it reached out over here, right? And those three things, is that something that we also see in our firmware analysis? And if the answer is yes, then that's a good sign, right? If this device is suddenly getting an update from somewhere that we didn't find at all in our firmware analysis, that could be bad. That could be something's happening there, something's going wrong. So we can match up what we see and what we expect the software to be doing with what it's actually doing. Another way to look at that. And that's a really fun and challenging problem as well. So in summary, product security is not a pen test. It's not a point in time. It's not an SBOM. It's not an AppSec program. It's a whole life cycle that we have to build around securing our software supply chain. That's it. That's all I got. Anybody have any questions? I think we're pretty close on time here. 
securing against like CVs that have already been discovered? How how do they go about finding new zero days? That's a great question. Probably um, not specific to to product security. That's more of a reverse engineering problem generally. Um, you look for like specific notable vulnerabilities in a compiled binary. And then you try and exploit those vulnerabilities in such a way that allows you to ex you know, execute whatever code you want. So one of the famous things, of course, is buffer overflow. Are you familiar with that mm -hmm. from class or, or from industry? Um, that's a common thing. You can find buffer overflow vulnerabilities. Most of the time, they're not exploitable for whatever reason. Sometimes, though, they are. Sometimes, if you can write your code into a space where it shouldn't be, then the CPU will execute those commands, basically. And there's lots of individual things like that, of which I'm not you know, particularly familiar. I'm not a reverse engineer. But that's basically how those things are found. A lot of times, uh, low-hanging fruits are, if you're just doing like web application security, then you're probably just fuzzing a bunch of inputs. You're not really analyzing a binary like you would if it were firmware, but you're literally just saying, well, this, this web form takes this field as input, and I'm going to throw every imaginable thing in there. I'm going to throw weird characters in there. I'm going to throw really, really giant number of things in there. I'm going to throw you know, all sorts of different patterns in there and see if any of those things breaks the application. And if it causes the application to crash or causes some sort of problem or unexpected result, then you can start playing with figuring out whether or not you could give it commands. A login screen is a good example of this. Like if, you, if you're going to log into an app and the app takes your username and password and then does a direct database query with that data, well, then you can write a, you know, a SQL command or a database command as your login name, and it will inject that directly and run that probably heard of SQL injection and similar things, GraphQL injections also, I mean, all of those sorts of things. So yeah, th that's a totally different thing. It happens outside of product security alone. Very fun though. Reverse engineering. If you want to do that as a career, look for reverse engineering jobs. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. It's difficult. Um, yeah, it's it's we're getting better, and there's multiple different formats of S bombs um, where we keep iterating and getting better and better. You know, more rich in terms of detail like that. One of the newer models that's kind of being standardized upon right now is called Cyclone DX, and it allows a lot for more of that. Um, but if you think about like name and version is very easy. You could you could say like yeah we have OpenSSL 1.1.1, got it. But OpenSSL 1.1.1, what's the context of that? Is it part of a software package? Like it's literally the the open source code that was included in the software package and then compiled, or is that a compiled version of that that was incorporated because the firmware runs on Debian? So taking the context of that software, individual software component, starts to get much more difficult. And then you, you, when you think about, you build out an SBOM, and you, like more often than not, stuff like OpenSSL, you might have 30 or 40 occurrences of the same thing in your SBOM because it's coming from all those different sources. And so then, of course, you want to try and figure out how to deduplicate that, and that problem is super challenging because of the context where it came from basically but just to just like if you're looking at the level of just a simple name and version and you don't care about duplicates we're pretty good at that yeah we can pluck that out and and what my company does that i find really fascinating is that binary analysis piece so we will we will pluck that out of compiled firmware without any other input we don't need an s-bomb to start we don't need any other sorts of security data or tests. If you just give us compiled a compiled binary, you know, there's obviously there's weird formats and we 
you know, that we have to continue building out our ability to support. But for the most part, if you give us a compiled binary, we'll pluck out every single software component that's in there. And the cool thing about doing that versus starting with an SBOM that's given to you from a manufacturer or something is that you find a lot of those things that are unknown in the SBOM. And there's been plenty of times where we've identified components and our customers come back to us and say, like, oh, that's not in there. <laughs> it's not in here. It's not in this SBOM. The developers didn't say it was in there. It's definitely not in there. And so then we're like, well, maybe there's a, maybe we had a false positive or something. And no, it turns out it was in there. <laughs> that happens a lot from doing it from the binary because the binary doesn't lie. What's in there is in there. Did that answer your question fairly well? Yeah. Any other questions? I know we're getting close. To, uh, what time is the keynote? Uh, four, I think. I'm probably getting pretty close to a break and then a keynote. Yeah, four. Yeah, sweet. And there's a networking in Vendor Village from 320 to 345. Sweet. Is that just out in the hallway? Oh, OK. I guess I don't know where Vendor Village is, per se, unless it's where the tables are set up. Yeah, that's what the sign's at over there. OK, perfect. Well, um, I'll be there. I'll be at the InfraGuard booth. I'm also the president of Indiana InfraGuard. I think I might have forgotten that on my intro slide. But uh, everybody know what InfraGuard is? No. No? You, you're a member? Perfect. Um, so InfraGuard is a partnership uh, with the FBI and also state, local, law enforcement, academia, and industry. And all we're trying to do is increase the security of our critical infrastructure. So we do a lot of information sharing. We try to sponsor and host events. Um, you know, spread the word, basically. Members get regular updates from the FBI on pertinent infrastructure risks and threats and what actors are doing and things like that. Um, and then, yeah, we, we host, we try to host events where we talk on topics like this, where we can try and increase awareness around some of the new and emerging threats and threat landscapes and things like that. So, pretty cool organization. I don't, are you a student or are you a, yeah, I'm a student. I thought that might be the case. So, unfortunately, you have to actually have a job in critical infrastructure before you can join. Um, but if you have an internship or a co-op or something like that that would qualify, that does that does work. It doesn't have to be a full-time job. Okay. Well, I'm about to graduate. So Sweet. Yeah. All right. So you're ready for you're you're ready to come into product security and help us out. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Any other questions? Feel free to stop by the booth downstairs too. I'll be there. Cool. Well, I appreciate it, everybody. Thank you.